when a vehicle gets in a crash, there are certain steps firefighters take to ensure their safety and the safety of the scene. And this has gotten a little bit complicated since electric vehicles have shown up. When there's a car crash and we have to extricate a patient from a vehicle, traditionally with an internal combustion engine vehicle, we go for the battery cables. We cut a section out of the battery cable, rendering the vehicle safe. And this does two things. Number one, it reduces the fire risk. After a crash, things are compromised. We start our operations, we start moving metal. It's possible things short out. And on a low voltage system, 12 volt system, it's not typically a big deal, but it can start the vehicle on fire. I remember this one time we were doing a dash lift on a vehicle. We had the roof completely removed. The passenger was in the vehicle. The dash was down on her legs. As we were lifting that dash, something shorted out. It actually caused the wipers and the sprayers to go. Windshield fluid starts spraying the patient's face. Not funny at the time, but looking back on it, pretty humorous. The second thing is airbag deployment. We don't want those airbags deploying while we're operating inside those vehicles for our safety as well as the safety of the patient. Realistically, airbags have been around since the 80s. Very long time. But it took an incident in 1994, it happened in Dayton, Ohio, where the airbags deployed, injuring a firefighter. This type of situation could have killed that firefighter, and that incident alone changed the whole culture of the fire service when it came to vehicle extrications and the concern with airbags. Now I go back to standard combustion engine vehicles, it's very easy to make these vehicles safe. We cut a section out of the battery cable, disconnecting the 12 volt power source, and we're done. We know the vehicle is safe. Now it can be complicated because not every battery is under the hood. Some of these batteries are located under the front seat, in the trunk, in a wheel well. So finding the battery sometimes is difficult, but the actual operation of disconnecting that battery is pretty straightforward. Getting into electric vehicles, it's become very complicated because there's no set standard, and that's a problem. That's a huge problem because we have to reference what's called an emergency response guide to try to figure out how to disable these vehicles. And every manufacturer has a different method to disable these vehicles. GM, for the longest time, they had a high voltage disconnect, a very large orange plug that when you pulled that plug out, it disconnected the power. The problem with this disconnect is it is a high voltage device. A lot of current can be going through this device. So you have to take care when pulling this disconnect. And you only can do this if the emergency response guide says it's okay to pull. You don't see the high voltage disconnect so much in passenger vehicles anymore, but it's still around in heavy truck or a bus application. Many vehicles have gone to a low voltage disconnect or cutting a cut loop, but not every vehicle has a cut loop. Some vehicles have a low voltage service disconnect, like this Ford Mustang Mach-E. Or the Hyundai Ionic series, they use a fuse that has a sticker on it. Not the most convenient thing to find when you're a first responder. When you look at this ERG for a Rivian, it actually has us cutting through the C post in this vehicle. It's bad enough when we have a lack of standards around how we disconnect the power in these vehicles, how we disable these vehicles, but we also don't know what happens when we cut that cut loop, remove the service disconnect, or pull that fuse. Is it only disabling the high voltage? Is it disabling the low voltage? Do we still have airbags that are active? Is the BMS active? There's a lot of unanswered questions, and the deeper I dive into these questions, it seems like there's no standard across the industry. It seems like there's no standard across the manufacturer from vehicle to vehicle. So this is a huge problem for first responders because, again, we have to refer to the ERG, the Emergency Response Guide, to understand how to disable those vehicles. But when we use those tactics provided to us in the ERG, it doesn't tell us what we're actually doing. Throughout this video, I talk about a lack of standards, and that's not entirely accurate. There is the SAE J2990, and that details what vehicles should have in place for first responders. However, this is a standard that isn't really followed by the manufacturers at this time. They're taking bits and pieces of it, but unfortunately it's not a regulation, it's not mandated, so it's not entirely implemented. This is something that across the board, all manufacturers should get together on, should work through, and have consistent solutions so first responders don't have to guess on what to do when they get on scene to make these vehicles safe. 
I'm in contact with some great people within the industry, and I'm going to work to try to drive some change in this area because it's important that first responders have clear instructions on how to disable these vehicles. There should be no guesswork. We shouldn't have to rely on emergency response guides every time we get on scene. To learn more about emergency response guides, click this link right here.